Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very exciting to be talking about revolutionizing molecular diagnostics. We have Franco Goitze joining us on the show. Hello, Franco. Hello. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. We're very excited for this. And we also have Dr. Louis Metzger joining us on the show as well. Hello, Louis. Thank you. Thank you for coming Thanks on for again. We just crushed it at our event, Identifying and Correcting Perverse Incentives. That was a super fun event. I'm happy you were in attendance. That's actually where we met. Yeah. And because we had interviewed the Indie Bio Batch 8 class, but we didn't get to you. Hmm. And so now it's getting to happen. We're very excited to talk about this. For those that don't know Franco's background, he's co-founder and CEO of Casper Biotech, which is a CRISPR-based company powering the next generation of diagnostics. And you can find the link in the bio, that's caspr.bio, as well as all of his LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram profiles, as well as a profile to BioCaptivate to your Bioscientists and Lewis's Twitter as well. So Franco, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? <laughs> well, that's, that's a, a good question. I, I think, I'm, I mean, I'm excited for, for the direction of, of our world. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm young, I'm, I'm 24 years old, so I try to measure like every 10 years, to try to go back 10 years to, to see where I was when I was 14 and when I was four years old. And I think that I changed a lot, obviously, because I, I grew up, I, I went through adolescence, a lot of things, but also how I saw the world change in those 20, 24 years. Uh, I'm, I'm super, super excited for the next 10, 20, and 50 years. So, so I think uh, there's, there's a lot of things happening. It's, everything is, is becoming exponential in terms of, of biology, technology, biotech. Uh, and, and in that sense, I'm, I'm very excited for, for what is to, to come for this world. And what do you think is a core principle or ethic that we need to all embody to make sure we prosper really well moving forward? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I always, myself, I, I always try to, to be like unrelenting, like very curious about stuff and, 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 and curiosity has its, its good aspect and also its, its, its negative aspect. It's, it's always important to em embrace like healthy curiosity and, and, and to, to, to try to to, to, to remain vigilant about things that are, that are going on, but, but obviously take into account the, the other and, and the people that surround us in, in, in those decisions that we make at, at a daily basis. And then what about your journey? You're born in Buenos Aires in Argentina, and then you, as a kid growing up, how did you get interested in biotech? Who were you growing up? Tell us about that. Um, the truth is, as a kid, I, I was never interested uh, about biotech. I mean, that's, I, I wasn't good, particularly good at science or biology or chemistry, whatever, in school. Uh, I, I kind of got into biotech at, at a l relatively later stage. Uh, so I, I, studied, I, I, I studied economics with a specialization in healthcare. Cool. So that was when I, I started to, to get the feel about healthcare and diagnostics and therapeutics, and, and in that sense, that was my first step into what today is, is, is my biotech profile. And what was it like growing up in Buenos Aires in Argentina? What is that like compared to you know, the Silicon Valley culture now? I mean, I, I love my country, I love Argentina, I love Buenos Aires, obviously. Uh, as being a, a, a developing country, we have our, our economic, risks and our turmoils in, in, in socioeconomic terms, uh, but in terms of the quality of life and, and the opportunities which I had given the, the, what, what my, pa my, parents, my parents gave to me, I, I was very lucky in, in, in that sense. Uh, and, and I was able to, to enjoy uh, a lot of, of the country and take risks uh, at a very young age uh, that being a, a, a luxury and, and, and something that I, very, I am very, very grateful, but to which a lot of, of people within the country and within the world don't, don't have that luxury of, of being capable of taking risks. Uh, and, and in that sense, uh, I, I, I feel lucky and I want to give back to, to the world in, in terms of what we develop in, in Casper as, as, as technology and, and, and in other possibilities. And before we get there, I also want to showcase how cool it is that when you were studying economics at the University of San Andreas yes. in Argentina, that you founded Ando, yeah. which is a B2B last mile logistics solution, and that was acquired. And you founded that when you were 21? 
Yeah, that's right. Very bad. That was in first second year of college, uh, and Ando was a yeah a, 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 a startup which solved the the last mile logistics for for e-commerce with, within the city and the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we I grew up from a team of just myself and doing the first deliveries in, in my own bike mm -hmm. to a team of of 10, 12 people, and and in that sense it was a very good experience for, for me uh, showing what it was like to execute on, on a startup from leveraging the, the, the right team, the, the right investors, the right advisors towards fulfilling on, on that vision and, and executing. And then also that um, you participated in two really cool immersion programs, one of them the U.S. Department of State Young Leaders Initiative, which brought 250 entrepreneurs from Latin America and the Caribbean for a one-month immersion program in the U.S., and then also the Westerwell Foundation, which brought 25 entrepreneurs from emerging countries to come to Germany to connect with the European hmm. startup infrastructure. I thought when you were teaching Lewis and I about this before the show started, I was like, this is very cool. It's a great way to bring people together from around the planet, but it's also like we want to make sure that sometimes that you guys are also bringing your brilliance to home as well yeah. to help. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think they were two very different but great experiences. Uh, connecting with other 249 entrepreneurs from Latin America and the Caribbean here in, in the U.S. In, in a fully immersive program. And, and connecting with relevant players within the industry for each of those startups or each of those entrepreneurs was, was a great personal experience. And, and in that sense, it was a program which was fully funded by the US Department of State. Uh, and, and, and it was an, an important decision to make from, from that side. And, and in, in, in my case, uh, it, it played really nicely in, in terms of the opportunities which arise from that experience. The Western world was, was, was a similar program focusing on, on developing countries from all over the world. Uh, so bringing entrepreneurs, 25 entrepreneurs from all over the world to, to Germany for a one week program. Uh, and, and there we, we also got to, to, to connect with a lot of relevant people within the startup ecosystem of Europe. And those are connections which I, I still have at a personal level one or two years after. I love that. That's the slow but sure we're coming together as a planet through programs like yeah, that. Yeah, too. yeah. I I'm, that. I'm a fan of those programs. I love that. Yeah. And then, all right, now, for also for, <laughs> for those that, that, that are wondering, you know, okay, this is interesting, you know, Lewis is on the show. <laughs> and this is because uh, Lewis is going to get into some of the deeper biotech stuff, and I'm going to act as the child here. <laughs> um, so, okay, now let's, <laughs> let's jump into uh, Casper Biotech. So, what is this, how did this come up? What was the story behind it? Teach us about it. Of course, so uh, I st started Casper Biotech with my, my co-founding team of, of, of three uh, scientists that, that belong to, to the, the equivalent of, of the NIH in Argentina, which, which would be CONICET. And they were kind of the pioneer group for CRISPR within Argentina and Latin America leading in seminars and presentations. So they were very present within, within the region. Uh, and, and they were using CRISPR for all kinds of, of interesting things, such as re cellular reprogramming, epigenetics, mostly working with, with Cas9. Uh, and I, I came upon them and, and CRISPR, and, and at first instance was fascinated about the technology and also about this, this great group of people that were really open to sharing their insights and their experience with CRISPR that they had been working on for more than five or six years together, two of them being PhDs in, in, in CRISPR uh, as, as a group. And, and from, from not only their, their willingness to, to share their experience, but also their, their willingness to, to, to work together and, and to do something which in, in Argentina is kind of considered crazy, which is jumping from the academia uh, from, from basic research to uh, having or executing a, a startup and making the technology that they've been researching about something with, with a concrete application. So that was kind of, of the head start of wanting to do something together. Uh, I had no idea, no background on, on CRISPR, on, on biotech. I had some minor background on, on, on healthcare. Uh, and, and in that sense, for, for me, it was a, 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 a learning from, from the ground up yeah. of, of, of everything CRISPR related. And it was a, a great experience because I, I love to, 
to be challenged and, and, and to, to face new information every, every day. Uh, but it, it was difficult, obviously. And, and in that sense, we, we got together, we, we saw about the possibilities that of what arises from, from this technology and the potential of executing that from Argentina to the, the world in, in general. And within the CRISPR diagnostic space, uh, which was kind of just getting published with, with, with some recent papers from, from both the UC Berkeley group and, and Broad Institute, was that we, we found a very interesting solution that was much needed within the region and within the world, obviously, for having better, more accessible, faster diagnostics. And, and in that sense, we, we focused and, and we said, okay, there's something here that, that we can do, we can execute, and, and we can do well, and decided to, to co-found Casper Biotech. Uh, and we're lucky enough to, to, to be invested by, by one of, of like, uh, an, an investment group, which comes from, from the main uh, pharma companies from, from Argentina. Cool. So there we, we raised our, our first pre-seed round, and that was about December of, of last year. Mm -hmm. And when we were just about to, to get started in Argentina, um, we got connected to IndieBio, cool. which told us, hey, don't start in Argentina. Come here to the US, to San Francisco, and, and start here directly. So in January, February, we, we, we moved here, we, we ordered our first reagents here to, to, to IndieBio, and the promise or the premise of, of IndieBio was you'll move 10 times faster. Mm -hmm. And looking back to it, we, we really moved at least 10 <laughs> times faster. I mean, we, we really felt that. We, each week we, we were moving at a pace in which we, we, we couldn't pre previously imagine. And, and then maybe I, I can get back to, to why was it that, that we were able to, to move so fast uh, with, compared, with a comparison to what we might be, have been able to achieve in these six months in, in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. But for us, it was uh, the, the best decision we were possibly capable of doing. And, and yeah, b being here in San Francisco, being in Indibio was, was a game changer decision. And now walk us through, yeah, walk us through what, what's the problem in healthcare that you saw and yeah. then what does Casper do to, yeah, to address it? Yeah, so, so the basic problem that, that we saw within healthcare uh, is, is diagnostics and, and diagnostics uh, has a, a lot of variables which account to, to that problem. Uh, and those are, I mean, th there's some components at a general level and some components which are region specific. So, so they're based on, on, on which part of the world you, you, you see it from. Uh, oh, and that's actually the next, I think the next slide shows the, um, one of the, this is a climate specifically that, that you can get a lot of insights from because certain yeah. things live in these uh, yeah. extreme I mean, environments. That, that's yeah. the CRISPR side to, to, to what we see. But in terms of, of the diagnostics problem, uh, the, the variables, the important variables are, are, are the speed for result, uh, mm -hmm. the, the accessibility component in terms of both the costs. And speed for diagnostics. Yeah. Okay. Uh, accessibility in terms of cost, and most importantly in terms okay. of where can we diagnose today which is highly limited to uh, in hospital or in lab diagnosis, and the possibilities which arise from a technology such as CRISPR. Cost, speed, and location. Yeah. What are we diagnosing? To, I mean, today, what are, I mean, today we're, we're diagnosing for, for a lot of things. In Casper, uh, we're diagnosing using CRISPR, which obviously when people hear and, and know about CRISPR, they mostly associated it to, to gene editing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was kind of the, the first described utility of, of, of CRISPR. And in that sense, it, it's a technology that within that field is said to, to change the world for, for all, uh, all of us. Um, the, the diagnostics activity of, of CRISPR or, or, or its utility comes from not Cas9 as, as the key enzyme, but rather a, a, another enzyme within the CRISPR world that was uh, discovered some, some years ago by the scientific community, which are Cas enzymes which have collateral activity. So Collateral activity. Yeah. Cas enzymes with collateral activity. With collateral activity. Okay. So they're very similar in some traits with, with Cas9, uh, in the sense that they have this very specific, I mean, you configure them through a guide RNA, uh, you have this, the same configuration towards a specific DNA sequence or RNA sequence, amino acid sequence, that you want to, to detect. 
uh, or, or to, to identify. And in the case of Cas9 for, for gene editing, the, the Cas enzyme will find it, uh, cut it, edit, uh, and that's like the gene editing capability. For diagnostics, the Cas enzyme will, will also, Cas12 will also find its, its target sequence if it's present cut it, and after doing that first cut, it, it will kind of go crazy. And then we can show a, a, yeah, a cool animation. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, yeah. so let's show the next slide, Ron. So this is the Cas12 enzyme. Yeah. Most people are familiar with the Cas9 yeah. enzyme. Yeah. Okay, and so this class of Cas enzymes hmm. have different applications. The Cas9 makes identifies the sequence, makes an edit, and then inserts yeah, that's right. new DNA. Hmm. But Cas12 identifies, cuts, and then... Goes crazy. Goes basically. crazy? Basically. Okay, <laughs> and we have that video, but quickly, what, um, teach us about this cat, what is this Cas family? What are yeah. we even, so, yeah. So, the, the, the premise is Cas enzymes uh, are, are present within nature itself in, in, in as a defense system for bacteria and archaea against viruses. So, so that's how okay. CRISPR uh, was, was, is the original functionality of, of CRISPR in nature. A and bacteria, bacteria's defense system. Yeah. And we don't have that. We don't uh, naturally uh, have it. I mean, we? we kind of okay. have, but there's, there, I mean, you, you could argue that there's CRISPR there. But um, th that's how, I mean, that's where CRISPR uh, was, is, is, is originally from. What the scientific community recently discovered was that we could re-engineer uh, CRISPR uh, with, with our own configuration of, of an input of what we want to identify. So we, we would re-engineer CRISPR. Uh, and, and in that sense, what we, we found or, or an idea we had from a very early stage was that there have been some Cas enzymes described uh, and, and, and found, so Cas9, Cas, Cas12, Cas13, Cas14. But well, there are many more Cas enzymes within nature to, to be discovered. So the focus of, of identifying those cool. has been mostly around uh, metagenomic data that has been published, uh, so in NCBI or, or other, other databases. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we focused on finding or, or processing metagenomic data which was unpublished. And with, within unpublished data, we, we focused on data from extreme environments. So, so in that sense, uh -huh. it's not that we personally went, but rather we, we did partnership agreements of exclusivity with research groups in, in, in Argentina, in other countries of Latin America, from very precise locations. So Antarctica, uh, Lanin Volcano, <laughs> Hot Springs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool places, obviously. <laughs> Uh, and and we, we just processed their data from those research groups that found no, no value within that data. It was like, I, I have that data, but I'm not using it for anything. I'm just maybe publishing some papers. Uh, and, and we processed it, and, and from there, applying our own criteria, we found novel or candidate novel CRISPR-Cas9, Cas12 enzymes, and that is an example of, of what we found, a uh, novel Cas12 enzyme. Uh, which, uh, as you see, is, is novel in the sense that it has a very low percentage identity when compared to any other CRISPR-Cas enzyme, but uh, has the key catalytic amino acids which make it functional and make it belong to the Cas12 family, for example. That is something that we found for now, uh, and also we found the Cas9, but there's still much more to, to be discovered in terms of other variants of Cas12, Cas9, as well as different systems which are there in nature and which we haven't found for now. So Franco, th this really excites me hmm. uh, because one of the theses that my colleagues and I have had uh, for some time now is that one reason to preserve species diversity is also to preserve the genomic and hmm. genetic diversity uh, of life that's evolved because this very useful uh, Cas uh, enzyme evolved in conditions that are probably difficult or impossible to replicate. Yeah. And so uh, would you, you know, imagine that there are many other valuable enzymes of, of, of this class out there to be discovered? Def yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's much more to be discovered. And in that sense, 
when we were talking with these first groups that, that wanted to join our initiative, they were like, I mean, they were begging us, please find something here because if you find something, I will be able to convince local authorities that there's value oh. in, in, in this place and preserving its nature rather than just uh, making it a, a site open to tourism or, or building or mining or, or, or having diverse commercial activities from that region. If you're able to show that there's, there's value in, in preserving this nature and that we can help towards a better world, in, in our case, through better diagnostics, um, then I will be able to make a statement. And in that sense, one of the enzymes that we found was from one of these places in, in, in Argentina. And, and we're, we're presenting this information to local authorities saying, hey, here you have, this is, is, is a big deal, this, this will help the world. Wow. So this is, uh, this is a, a positive example of bioprospecting in action. And uh, that's really great that you're, you're reconnecting with the local governments and mm. showing them how there's this value that many people don't think about. In fact, most people don't know about. And as synthetic biology or biological engineering or whatever you want to call it grows as a field, we're going to discover more and more of this value so that we, we don't want to lose it before we, hmm. we can find it and make use of it. Do you foresee uh, um, uh, Casper you know, looking for more Cas9 or, well, more Cas analogs in general? Yeah, I mean, th that's, that's an ongoing initiative in terms of striking more, more, more sure. deals with, with this kind of, of, of institutions and even financing our, our own uh, searches within, within the, the region. <laughs> so cool. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and yeah, and also improving our criteria of what things to, to consider as candidate CRISPR systems. And they might not even be CRISPR systems, but just defense systems from, from bacteria and archaea. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot more to be discovered when, once you open the scope of, of what you consider as something interesting. And in that sense, that's something that we will be ramping up in, in the next months. This is, this is a great way to put it, is that when you look at the timeline of like deep time of, of existence, there's so many things that we can still mm identify that have occurred in the last billions of years of evolution that can give us unique insights into how to best augment our health or how to best build more sustainable futures just in general yeah. for ourselves. I, it's so cool that you can go to these extreme environments and find it and you just wonder how many unique things are buried in our archaeology of evolution that have been undiscovered and yeah. how hard where do we go to look for them how hard do we like these search missions that you're putting mm -hmm. on for biopreservation and yeah there's a, that was yeah it was bioprospecting that's a cool yeah that's a cool word yeah well and you know one important element of that i think is that there is a feedback to local communities mm -hmm. so in your yeah. case you are you know providing you know reason for the local governments to care about you know, environmental preservation and, and now are thinking about the potential value uh, of, of these, these enzyme variants that you're finding. Yeah. Um, also, uh, building upon that, uh, tell me a bit about um, what types of diagnostics you're really excited about. You yeah. know, your beachhead uh, and especially how that ties into Latin America. Hmm. And should we show the video yeah, too? I mean, that, yeah, that, that would that. be great. Okay, let's do that quick and then we'll let's yeah, see, yeah, that. Let's do okay. that. Okay. That's the next slide. The next is the video. And so this is what you're talking about with CAS 12. It does a... Yeah, that's, that's a CAS enzyme. A CAS enzyme. We configure a guide RNA, which okay. is complementary to the DNA sequence of the target you want to identify. So the CAS enzyme will search for the DNA sequence that, that it was configured for. And if it finds it, it will cut it. And after doing this, this is very specific to Cas12, it will go crazy, start cutting indiscriminately. So that collateral cut activity we use by attaching the, a reporter system, which is a fluorochrome and a quencher, uh, which are those what? QFs. And Oof. as the Cas enzyme is cutting and was cutting like crazy, that system, I mean, those will generate fluorescence, will generate an indication that the target pathogen, infectious disease, or genetic mutation was present in the sample. And this we configure, it's kind of a platform in the sense that you can configure for any type of, of those targets. And uh, the input or the sample can be blood, saliva, urine, uh, 
the, the, the possibilities are, 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 are very vast. And, and most excitingly, this technology can be configured or, or yeah, can, can be established in, in diverse formats. So it's, 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 it can be applied within labs, so as, as a lab developed test in its most elementary form, uh, just on a reagent basis of, of these three components, the CAS, the guide, and, and the reporter system, basically. Uh, in what, what is a, a really disruptive format, which is in, in a disposable point of care like uh, diagnostics format. So, so doing diagnostics, high precision diagnostics in places in which it wasn't possible before, and CRISPR is enabling that, that kind of solution. Uh, so, so those are the, the, the main formats in which this technology can, can be integrated and can solve precise problems for diverse targets in, in each of those fields. And wow. as, uh, I mean, our focus uh, as, as, as Casper is to, to, I mean, what we see as, as the, the main value proposition or the distinctive value proposition of, of this technology is its accessibility component. So at a cost basis compared to, to PCR, that has a, a, a strong advantage. Which uh, also takes longer. Yeah, I mean, within the, it kind of takes longer because it's limited to, to in-lab diagnostics. To so in-lab diagnostics, yeah. okay, but, versus but lower But comparing cost. for in-lab diagnostics, uh, the, the cost side, which uh, is, is even more, more pronounced in, in developing countries, as everything has to be imported, and oh, wow. the, yeah. the accessibility of doing diagnostics in, in places in which it wasn't possible before. So doing point, point of care diagnostics with, within hospital rooms or directly in pharmacies or, or direct to, to, to consumers for specific targets in what would be a, a lateral flow solution or a disposable uh, card solution. And, and that is brought as, as a possibility solely from, from, from the properties and the simplicity that, that CRISPR has. And what, what was happening at the very end there? There's a reporting system? Yeah. So, so this, is, this is with CAS12 specifically, that enzyme? No, the reporting no. system is, is like generally known from, from the scientific community. Of, you of, bring the reporting system with the yeah, CAS12? Yeah, no, I mean, you, 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 you input into, into the, the reaction or, or you pre-configure this reporting system that has fluorescence inhibited as, as, as a default. And once the CAS enzyme is cutting, yeah. fluorescence is ignited. And, and that fluorescence that you get uh, is for a positive detection of, of the target if, that you configured. If, if fl the fluorescence occurs if there's a positive detection yeah, that's right. in the diagnostic. Yeah. And so you can, you, you're adding, you, you, but you add a reporting system into the CAS enzyme as it goes to identify the certain yeah. segment of DNA. That's right. And then it makes the cut and then the reporting system will fluoresce. That's right. If it's a positive detection yeah. for if, if there's no positive disease. detection, there will be no cut and there will be hence no fluorescence. And also the amount of fluorescence that you get highly is, is highly correlated the amount of with the amount of target pathogen that you had within the sample. So in that sense it not only detects but it also quantifies. Whoa, so yeah, so barely any brightness, not too much of the disease, a lot of brightness, yeah. you need to be treated fast. Yeah. And yeah, and cheap um, also for being able to ship into uh, developing countries, all this type of stuff around yeah. the world, affordable faster, yeah, okay. Mm. And Interesting. Mm. And so how many other cool discoveries like this are there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, what's exciting about this is it's, it's a really nice platform technology. Mm. And I think that, that platform technologies in general um, are sometimes not, are sometimes undervalued uh, early in their life cycle until everyone realizes that they're useful. Mm. Uh, give, us some, give us some examples of what most excites you about this platform going forward, where there's some proof of concepts that really stood out in your mind when you did these initial experiments and you said to yourself, the team said to itself, hmm. hey, this is something we really need to run with. This is going to work. Yeah. Uh, so what were some of those moments or applications? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are various cases in, in which we, we see that uh, on, on a regular basis, but a, a very interesting example that at a personal level, I, I, I really 
enjoyed or, or said, hey, there's something here, we really have to make this happen, uh, was in, 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 in a, a pilot we did with a, with a hospital in the north of, of Argentina in Misiones, which is right next to, to Brazil, which is, is like a, a, a tropical area. Uh, so they, they suffer a lot from tropical viruses and, and, and dengue particularly. Uh, and, and this is a lab that had P has PCR equipment, but given the, 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 the depreciation of the currency and the cost in dollars of importing PCR uh, reagents, they discontinued the use of PCR. Mm. So all of their diagnostics was based in the lab using ELISA. Huh. Uh, and, and in that sense, when we came with our pilot and showed them the lab developed test format uh, that of what they could do within the lab and the cost that that would have in the market they all, they were, they were like very excited and when we showed them the possibility of which arise of, of a validation that we did with a lateral flow uh, strip so no equipment mm -hmm. no need for a centralized lab just detect di diagnostics at point of care in, in less than 30 minutes they, 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 they were thrilled, they, they, they almost started crying because this would change a lot the, the, the diagnostics and, and the following of, of, of detections of, of, of tropical viruses within the region uh, to another level. And, and in that sense, they, 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 they put all their, their effort and their samples and, and said, we want to help you guys doing this. This is something that can change the the, the landscape for the region. And what, wh how does this work? So if you bring um, Casper to this tropical region and you want to help them detect dengue, mm. do the diagnostic, they, they take a blood or a saliva sample. Yeah. And then what do they do with that? And then what is your array that yeah. can very quickly? I mean, we're, we're, we're developing two, two formats. Uh, one, I mean, and, and we, we already have results to show from, from that in, in the format that, that we, we already developed. One is the LDT format, which, which I, I spoke LDT. about. LDT. Yeah, lab developed test. Lab developed so, test. So this is just using the equipment that they already have, uh, which is standard within laboratories to measure for fluorescence. Uh, and instead of using a PCR mix, so reagents for PCR, which have to be imported and, and which are already costly, uh, they instead use the Casper CRISPR mix. So they would use our CRISPR mix okay. within those equipment. Okay. And the workflow so would be... So it's proprietary um, CRISPR mix. Yeah. when I mean, you deliver to these, for these lab developed yeah, tests. Yeah. And that, okay. that is the, 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 the first solution in which our, our go-to-market, I, I mean, given the, the low regulation for, for lab developed tests and, and that you don't have to do approval from FDA or equivalent within those countries, that's something that in less than 12 months will, will enable us to, to generate traction and, and to already start setting a solution for them. Uh, and, and then the second format, which is kind of the one that really changes the workflow, not only at a cost side, but rather at, at an, an industry-wide perspective, is the, the, the point of care. So, so the lateral flow uh, strip, which is, is not, okay, I, I have to extract blood from this patient, and take it to the central laboratory where it will be run in a batch format and, and delays may, may happen and trained people are required and electricity and, 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 and all these this, this variables which account for a higher cost, but rather is a direct from saliva or, or blood input into this lateral flow, so lateral flow uh, kit. kit. Uh, and, and from there, in less than 30 minutes, if you get one indication, it's a positive. I mean, if, based on, on the indication, on the mark which appears, it's either positive or, or, or negative. And there's a semi-quantitative component to that where you can kind of more or less see uh, the, the, the load of, 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 of that. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, that is more, it's our, our, our time to market for that is, is a little bit uh, further or a bit longer because you, you have to, to get that approved and, and for now what we have of technology is, is capable of de detecting for a single plex uh, and, and that provides value for certain contexts but the, the best solution if we're able to push the limit of, of, of the technology 
is a multiplex within uh, uh, this kind of point of care diagnostics. And that is what we want to bring to market when, when taking into account that uh, lateral flow solution. Now, this really excites me because mm. I spent some time thinking about multi-drug resistant bacteria mm. and all the different resistance markers that one might measure in those bacteria could be easily measured, I think, by Casper's technology because you're probing for differences in the DNA yeah. and you can be very specific. Yeah. So I can see you know, applications of your, your multiplexed uh, uh, um, you know, cutting technology, as it were, um, in you know, antimicrobial resistance uh, mapping yeah. uh, and stewardship. And so, but there's so many other, other possibilities. Um, I know that you're interested in some uh, um, functional genomics applications mm. uh, of your platform. And I was wondering if you were going to maybe tell us if, about a few of those. Yeah, I mean, go, going back to the first point of, of what you mentioned with regards to antimicrobial resistance, mm -hmm. we, we know of, of the relevance of, of, of this phenomena uh, and, and that is really worrying f for, for the world in, in what, are, what, what are the projections of, of estimated deaths or, or the burden that this will have over the, the world in, in the next 30 years. By 2050, it's estimated that 10 million people could die about antimicrobial resistant related issues. Uh, and, and in that sense, we've already done validations for the, the main antimicrobial resistances such as KPC, NBM, OXA. Uh, and we, we, we want to bring that kind of solution to, to, to market. Uh, it's, it's a complicated target as, as a whole and a complicated area, but it's definitely something that we will be pursuing in, in the next years. And in terms of uh, applications in more, you know, more broadly, just in functional genomics yeah. discovery for Casper's platform, uh, do you have you know, sort of thoughts around that enzyme discovery in nature? Yeah, I mean that that is what we we were talking previously. That in in the sense that we will be ramping up on on our our, our input or our processing of, of data from from these precise environments that that that, that we, we we look for. And can we bring up the fifth slide as well? Yeah. The last slide will help too. And yeah, thanks, Ron. Also, it's, it's a matter of, of us improving our, our criteria. And, and that is what enables us to, to I mean, it, it's not that we just find CAS enzymes because sure. it's fun for us or, or, or it's cool to, to have new CAS enzymes, but rather because those CAS enzymes can have key improvements on specific variables of stability, uh, of performance, specificity in the diagnostics application that, 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 that we want to take to market. And also in other fields in which maybe we, we pre-configure our search towards those enzymes that have this collateral activity or, or which are, are of specific interest for us. But the truth is you never know what will be the end functionality of something new that you discover. And in that sense, the, the options of it being applicable for other industries and, and other purposes beyond, including gene editing, but beyond just mm -hmm. gene editing, are, are also very high and, and, and it's a possibility of, of what we see in, 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 in what we process. And we're not the only company that's looking for, for, for this kind of, or, or has seen the value within finding or, or trying to find this, this kind of novel systems. And, and I think that it's great that a lot of people go out there and, 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 and try to process with different criteria and, and to find their, their, their own novel systems to, 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 to use within specific industries. You know, changing gears a little bit, yeah. um, you have a really, you've had a special experience in that you were not initially trained as a scientist, mm. but you're, you're becoming one, mm. beca have become one, uh, and you've had a foot in both the scientific startup world and community in Latin America and now in the US. Yeah. And I was curious, you know, what do you, how would you compare and contrast those two environments? For, uh, and, you know, uh, what does Latin America do better than us? Mm. And what's easier here? I'm just curious what your experiences have taught you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really new within science as, as, as the category, but most of what I, I got to know about Argentina and Latin America as, as a scientific community comes from the experience of, of my co-founders mm -hmm. 
one of them, Federico, that, that has a trajectory of more than 15 years within science in Argentina and Latin America. And in that sense, there's like very interesting and um, a positive side of, of the community. Uh, and, and there's obviously some disadvantages or, or the downside of, 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 of the region. Um, for example, with regards to, to, to the downside, uh, there's the, the need for importing most of the reagents and uh, the time that it takes in, in terms of, of waiting. One can, can wait two or three months for, for a reagent to arrive when you compare with the timing here in the US, which is about two days. In two, less than two days, you, you can receive your reagents. That is crazy. Uh, and for a startup, that's even more crazy and, and even more um, difficult. Um, that, that as an example, and also the, 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 the changing currency and depreciation of, of the, the local currency when buying things from, from abroad. Uh, on, on the positive side, you have this, I mean, the funding for uh, science, uh, at least in, in Argentina from CONICET, is really limited. So scientists within the country, they have to find their way around those limitations. They don't have the luxury of being capable of ordering everything mm -hmm. and, and having those arrive in, in two days or in a week, but rather have to be very strategic about their pipeline of what they want to do within the next six months, the next 12 months. And in, in that sense, I, I, I feel and I see that there's this, this spirit of, of making things happen uh, beyond just the limitation of resources. Uh, and, and in that sense, I mean, it's a real limitation of resources in the sense that my, my co-founders could, could do research, their, their budget for research for one year could be less than $10,000. So, so that's really difficult and, and they told, I mean, that even more, like, then going from those conditions and all the expertise that they had from, from there and transferring that to being, I mean, like playing in the Camp Nou, which would be like playing in, in the best pitch in the world and having to execute here against maybe people that have graduated from top universities or have, have had PhDs in top universities. Uh, we, we really work hard and, and are, are able to, to execute and, and to, to prove that there's, there's very good resources and, and knowledge with, within the Latin America, within Argentina on, on the science side. And, and that being in, in the correct conditions enables us, enables us to achieve great things. And, and that's what I've seen from, from my co-founders and what also the, the Indie Bio team and, and a lot of people which, which followed us in, in the six months mentioned about us that uh, we, we really performed fast. And that's not like a coincidence in the sense that I would see my, my co-founders leave the lab at three, four in the morning with some frustrated results about things that went wrong and then waking up the next day at seven in the morning and, and doing it all over again. Uh, so in, in that sense, we're, we're, we're a good team. There's a, a lot of potential from Argentina, from Latin America uh, in, in, in the science side. And also, I mean, it's, it's, it's knowledge and, and resources that are capable of coping with this limitation. Uh, so our, our product and our science headquarters will all be in, in Argentina. Um, and and we, we, we try to, to leverage and, 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 and to, to, to improve within the, the, the local scientific community. And, and we find that it's very strategic because there are great resources and the average wage for, for, for those kind of resources that we need within our team can be up to 5x uh, cheaper than, than when you compare with, with an average salary here in the US for that kind of position. So when during the program, being here at week two, when we said, OK, we have to hire a bioinformatic, which was our, like our, our first exter external hire, we searched for people with, here within the, the US. And I mean, not, not, to, not to be rude, but the, the average salary which we saw was kind of surprised <laughs> us. And was, we, we kind of got scared. Of, oh, oh this, is, this is very expensive. Like, this pays for all of our four, four salaries just by hiring this, this new person. Uh, and th there were interesting uh, profiles, but no one that stood up. Uh, and in that sense, 
we decided to, to contact people from Argentina. We got a reference from someone that we didn't even know, but was just the kind of person that we needed in terms of commitment, in terms of his previous experience. And we offered him to, to come live with us for, for the next three, four months, be a part of our team in, in during the Indie Bio phase. And th that was like the key hire of our team, our only hire, but the key hire. Uh, and and he, he proved to be a, a, a great person within the team, which really adapt. And also for, for our, our future, he's now a full-time person with, within the team. Uh, and we, 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 we lived in this house, like the five of us for the four months. So, so we almost <laughs> killed each other, but then came along and, and became very, very close friends and, and team members. So, so in that sense, there's, there's this two-sided uh, part of, of, of science within limited resources countries yeah. and, and science within the, the US or, or other yeah. reference countries in, in the world. Speaks to the network effect yeah. too, that the powers that gain the most at the very beginning are likely to play their own hand, deal to themselves more um, later on and figure out how exactly to build moats around themselves to protect others, only, or to protect their own resources. But how can that's such an important aspect of what we care about talking about and what we did our panel on is how to figure out how to help bring the world closer together with all of these opportunities and providing people an abundance of options for them to figure out what is the child's North Star? How can they go and pursue it themselves? It's something that we care about so deeply and that we want to help spread that meme and spread those opportunities around the world make it easier for people to actualize and bring their unique gifts to the world. Yeah, mm. that's a big picture stuff yeah, that we yeah, care about definitely. a lot. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, Louis, do you have another question that you want to ask? I have one other thing I oh want to ask. Ahead. Okay, just on the data side of things, mm. um, it just seems like the future of where we're going is me just having a constant stream of my biometrics just mm. uh, inputted into a computer that's just processing the stream of data and then just being like, Hey, your you know stool sample or your heart rate variability or you know X Y Z whatever, um, you're at risk for this type of brain malfunction. Like you should consider doing this exercise or eating this way or sleeping a little bit more. Blah blah blah. It's just like endless, right? This, yeah. So is that what you see as like this future of biotech? I mean, data will just keep on flooding, flooding us, and, and it, it will be a, a lot of around healthcare and, and, and personal healthcare oriented metrics. Uh, it, it, it's, for now, it's, it's something good uh, for us. Uh, it might reach a, a level in which so much data at a, at a, contact, at a, at a constant pace or, or at, a, at a constant feed for us uh, becomes too much data and kind of becomes unproductive or unhealthy for one own mental health of, of, of seeing at, at a minute by minute basis how each one's decision in terms of what you eat or, or, or what, what, what you, how, how you, you cough or whatever, whatever you, you do in terms of, of your body. Like instantly yeah. knowing that you've yeah. picked yeah. up might, one might of the viruses. Might, might affect your, 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 your projected lifespan uh, yeah. and, and seeing how that Changes. increases or decreases like yeah. in, in, a, yeah. in a minute basis obviously that's that's very scary and and that would be totally i mean i i wouldn't like that uh, maybe some people would would like to to see that and would like to see how that increases or decreases uh over time i i think that i mean that's something that that we'll see how how the industry evolves and, and how is it that that information is incorporated into the decision-making process? And obviously, one cell has to have the capability of, of deciding over its own health and, and knowing that information. But also, at some instances, it's always good to have the intermediate position of uh, a professional or a doctor that can incorporate that information and, and deliver to the patient. Mm. Uh, on, on delicate subjects, mo most most importantly, so so in that sense, uh, that articulation or, or, or that mid step will 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 also have to 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 continue being there, and it won't be just all my information for myself, but 
there, there always has to be an, an informed or, or a professional within uh, for, for some uh, indications or, or for some diseases. And, um, and yeah, it just seems like this is going to be um, the part of this discovery process. So, you know, hmm. how are we going to be discovering the right um, aspects of this biotech archaeology and applying it for diagnostics, applying it for all different aspects of our healthcare, for agriculture, for all different types of things? It's just a very interesting part of this biotech explosion that's happening. So, of course, yeah, I mean, at least in, in the the precision molecular detection field. This is something that goes way beyond just healthcare diagnostics and, and extends to an industrial level, to uh, food safety, to farming, to agriculture. Uh, and those are all industries in which there's already a, a, a detection or a diagnostics component within them, yeah. but it's highly limited to, to labs. And in that sense, taking the detection to the field can, can, can really improve on, on, on those industries in, in, in terms of their response or de their detection to, to, to pathogens, to fungi, to, 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 to different kind of kinds of things that, that might pose a, a risk to, to a, a population in general. Uh, and obviously responses to, uh, in terms of biosecurity to, to bioterrorism or, or other kinds of, of, of initiatives that uh, there's there's already some some really important people within the industry that are are scared of, of how that might play uh, at a worldwide basis over the next 10 or 20 years yeah. and having access to rapid uh, adjustable adaptable detection systems yeah. uh, is something that we really have to push and, and develop as, as there will be a timing in which that will be a uh, a problem, and, and we we have to have some kind of response prepared to that. I, Rapid I mean that's adjustable detection systems. Yeah. 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 Whoa. And, and I, I mean, one thing that excites me too is that these are uh, semi-quantitative, mm. uh, and so that's that's really exciting too. So if you're thinking of, of you know yeah. looking at a microbio microbiota of something. Mm. You know, you could even do a semi-quantitative census with, say, a yeah. future multiplex product that you might make. So that's really exciting, because you know, right now we often say, well, you know, species X is here, it's not here. But it would be nice to know. You, know, you can begin to look mm -hmm. at relative abundance. And it's uh, really exciting. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just yes or no on the diagnostic. It's also a quantitative amount of how mm -hmm. much that's in the future type thing. Okay. Um, okay. Just a couple quick questions um, on the way out. Are we in a simulation? Uh, uh, that's uh, um, <laughs> kind of. I mean, no, I don't know. Just do it in a question mark. I, question I, don't, mark. Know. I don't want to, to condition my, my simulation. <laughs> in any direction. I just yeah. leave it open yeah. for all the future yeah. possibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then what's the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful, well, the most beautiful, I mean, I will take it to a very, bias this for me the most beautiful thing in the world because I, I was born in, in Argentina and I'm, I'm a huge fan of football which you call soccer yeah, but football football yeah. I heard you reference camp now yeah the pitch yeah, yeah I yeah. mean and, and for me the, the most beautiful the most beautiful thing in the world is uh, the La Bombonera Stadium in, 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 in Argentina which is the the soccer stadium of, of Boca Juniors yeah, the the football the, stadium the, of, of which team? Of, of Boca Juniors. Boca Juniors. Yeah, interesting. Uh, that's I mean, I yeah. I kind of being here in the U.S. One of the things that I I missed the most was going to the Boca Juniors stadium. That, so that that's why you might find me in a melancholy moment. That's why yeah, I, yeah. I, I I I tended towards a physical construction as as the yeah, most yeah. beautiful <laughs> yeah. thing in the world, but it's. A, a marvelous. It's called the temple for the people. Oh, that it's know called it. temple. Yeah, so Whoa. it has its 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 mystical component and yeah. yeah. You played soccer. Yeah. Great. Yeah, me too. I love football so much, yeah. so much. Cool. Mm. Wow. Good stuff, guys. This yeah. has been this has been awesome. I mean, I had a lot of fun talking about this with you. Thank you for coming on, Franco. Thank you very much. We really appreciate. Sure. It, it was great to to have the the chance to to speak to be part of simulation and and look forward to to. To catching up with you guys in, in some time with with the updates of, of how yes. Casper has 
it's evolving and yeah, uh, please. what we're doing. Yeah, S solving some of the most pressing things around the planet. Good job. Good job, Franco. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thank interesting. You. Lewis, it's always nice to have you on as well. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Revolutionizing molecular diagnosis. Talk more about this with your friends, families, coworkers, people around the world on social media. Get talking more about this next generation of diagnostics. And also check out the links in the bio to Casper Bio, as well as check out Franco's other profile links. Check out BioCaptivate and Lewis's other links as well. And also support the artist entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support them, help them grow. Simulations links are in the bio below our Patreon, cryptocurrency, PayPal, our Design Cool Merchant Get Paid link. Go and support us. Thank you to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Greatly appreciate it. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Peace.